So, welcome everyone. After the uh, previous talk with two speakers of the same company, which had a very nice interaction, this is uh, rather unique for Hacker Hotel. We have two people of two different companies. We have our uh, Docker expert, Rick van Duin, <laughs> <laughs> of KPN Security. Oh, shit. <laughs> and we have Sean Fokker from McAfee. So it's two different companies. They were talking about the same uh, subject, but from two different perspectives. So I'm really, really glad to have them here. Please give them a very warm welcome and enjoy the talk about the Revil malware. Thank you. Thank you. That was an interesting story because um, you reached out to us or to me. It's like, oh, do you want to do talk? And then eventually through Twitter, I found out you were going to do a talk on Revil. I was like, I'm going to do a talk about Revil. So <laughs> it's like, can we free up some space? Because how are we going to compete with each other? So, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Yep. Rick, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Rick van Duin. I'm a security researcher at uh, KPN Security. Um, I've done most of, uh, most of my life I've been pen testing. Uh, and uh, yeah, just recently switched to more research purposes and even more recently switched to uh, malware analysis. So complete noob, uh, yeah, but it's been fun. My name's John, I work with McAfee, not to be confused with John McAfee. And my last name <laughs> is also John Fokker. This is for the Dutch people really easy, for the English people even easier. Um, <laughs> and for my work, I like to uh, hunt malware, um, sometimes domain admin credentials, and uh, mostly bad guys. Um, as you can see from the intro, our talk is about Shino, of our Sino, Shino, Sino Kibi. Re I can, I'm, I'm looking at this for more than a year, and I can still not pronounce it. So Revil is the easy name. Uh, it's mostly ransomware focused. We're going to do two perspectives, some stuff that we did from McAfee, some underground research, some code analysis and stuff, and then the stuff that Rick did as well. Yeah. And when we look at the l ransomware landscape from the last quarter, and this is, uh, we well, basically stole the figures from somebody else, but that, that doesn't matter. Uh, we see that Sonokibi makes up a big portion of the targeted ransomwares focusing on companies. The other one is Ryak but we'll leave that for a different talk. And you see that there's actually probably the influx of a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of players want to get a piece of the pie. So the last quarter, there's a lot more different firings coming up. But as we said, so on Kibi. We've been, we've been tracking this threat for, for a while now. And uh, one of the things we did, we were hunting for all these new hashes and new indicators, and we ran it on our backend. And that's pretty cool. Um, so you can see the global dispersion um, I don't know if the laser works on the screen, but you can also see that there's like not a little, not a lot of dots on the former cis countries that has a reason. So it goes on. And so there's a lot of red spots in the US and in Europe and some in Southeast Asia so, Asia. so basically where the money is, that's where they go. And for those who are not familiar with ReEvil, ReEvil is a ransomware as a service, as we call it. So the framework is being supplied by somebody else, and you as a entrepreneur can join in. It's like a pyramid scheme. Um, you're responsible for spreading, generating infections, and you get a piece of the pie, and another piece goes to the developers. We often see this, that a lot of developers do this from countries that are not, uh, where it's not illegal to develop malware and to deploy it, as long as you don't encrypt one of your own citizens. And it's an easy business model because the, most of the, the uh, risk lies with the affiliates because they do all the spreading, they leave most of the traces. So if your coding is solid, unlike the empty guys, you're pretty, pretty squared away. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the RAS model, as we say it, we have the ransomware operators or developers. And uh, they advertise. They could be on forums, can be on closed groups, Jabra, whatever. And they said, like, hey, we have a system and we allow for seats. And just like you're sitting right here, you can join in and make some money. They have to pay a fee to join in. And what they'll do, they'll get builds. And they guarantee that they can spread. So they have either spam, RDP, whatever. They will say, like, oh, I'll make X amount of money. And they'll spread these, um, their campaigns against victims. Well, what you see now, these are end victims. So this was mostly the old version of RAS uh, with CTB Locker, CryptoWall, and all those. And now you see predominantly there's companies 
on the, on the other side as the victims. So government institutions, beauticians, I believe, all Definitely. kinds of stuff. Doesn't matter. If you have an MSP service provider that doesn't use multi-factor authentication, um, it's not, it's just basically a matter of time, as we have seen. Well, anyways, those victims, they get encrypted. They're like, oh shoot, I need to get my files back. And they pay uh, the ransom. The ransom goes into the whole system, the framework that the ransomware developers have set up, and a cut of the ransom goes to the affiliates. Um, I've been researching GANGRAB before this, uh, quite significant, and what I've seen is this service model is really interesting, because um, unlike, like, for instance, you have NEMTI, in the talk before this, that's one of the more early stages of a ransomware as a service, whereas this more, so I'm keep an established uh, entity or a crime group, GANGRAB was so as well. And one of the things we've noticed is how do you build trust with your affiliates? Because you have to, there's this relationship you have. So if you want to set up a good ransomware as a service, you have to be really good at accounting because you get trust by paying your debts, just like a Lannister. And uh, we've seen that as well. So we saw that a true indicator for a service that's stepping up and becoming more professional is adding an indicator for each individual affiliate. So they can track back, well, this affiliate encrypted this group of victims, <laughs> so this amount of ransom that's paid out, that goes to this person. And in that way, you have kind of the accounting books. And funny enough, that's often in the malware. So what we did for GANGCRAP at the time, we created a structure. So we pulled those individual indicators for each and every affiliate out of the ransomware and grouped them. And this is obviously a very zoomed in or zoomed out picture. I have them all available as well, so if you're interested later on. And sure enough, you can see groups. You can see groups of affiliates uh, clustering together or they have campaigns clustering together. And we figured out that some of the, the, the shapes that we see could be linked back to, for instance, somebody who is outsourcing their own hacking. So you have one person who communicates with the big boss, and he's like, wow, shoot, I'm under a lot of pressure, and I need to get X amount of installs or, or victims. So as any uh, well entrepreneur will do, they will go on the forums and say, like, oh, who can help me with RDP hacking, get me more installs, and all these things. So there's this whole outsourcing stream. And you can see that back in these overviews. Um, Sure enough, our hunch was when we evil came around, and we were like, nah, maybe there's something in this ransomware as well. And there was. And um, sure enough, there's a similar similar structure going on. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit later on, on more of the similarities. Um, this was what sparked our enthusiasm. Um, I was looking at all these affiliate IDs. I was grouping them all per version of the virus. And the virus, they didn't mess with the compile dates and all these things. And version 5.2, the final version of GANGCRAB came out in February 2019. At May 31st, 2019, they said, like, oh, we're going on retirement. So if you follow the news, you might have seen it. We've made X amount of millions, yada, 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 yada. Funny enough, we're like, in February, we're like, wait a second. We're looking at all these affiliate IDs. There's IDs that have been very active. We've been matching them to, for instance, victim data and all this stuff and they're gone. Where are they? If this is a scheme that makes so much money, where do you go? It's like a party, like the party's going on and there's big people at the party and then all of a sudden all the party goers are left, but the party's still going on. So what did they do? Go, did they go to bed or did they go to the after party? So we, uh, we established that a certain amount of first affiliates were already gone at February um, 2019. And sure enough, I think, was it March, April-ish? Re-Evil came along. And this is uh, a posting on, uh, I think, Exploit still, Exploit IN, and this is the initial posting from, from a user named Unknown. Brian Krebs wrote this article about it, and um, we can confirm this is Sodom Kibi. So the actor Unknown, and it's really interesting. They, they give all the uh, specifications of people who want to join. Well, if you're bad at Russian, well, guess what? You're out of luck. Um, you're not allowed to encrypt Russia, and the, one of the things is they explained uh, the different cuts. Um, and it's not only that posting, but the posting below it, that's an individual by the name of Lalartu, um, that's what caught our interest as well, because he was a major affiliate in Gangcrap. He was a very influential cybercriminal member in the underground, 
and he moved, he jumped ship. So is he one of those that left the party early? So we became the look. And then later on, they left it, they weren't really clear about it, but at a certain moment, they posted themselves. They said, like, yes, we were a former part of Gang Crab. We got the source code, and we did our thing for ourselves. Is this a cover story? Because it's criminal saying something? We don't know, but there's something in the code. So when we look at the code, and I realize we're going to go in a, a killing tempo, by the way, because both Rick and I have blue bracelets, so we have to, din have to go to dinner early. <laughs> we compared the code to Gang Crab. And sure enough, there was 40% code overlap. That's not a lot. But when you look at the individual functions, there were functions that were identical. Um, I believe your company wrote a blog on the URL definition, the generation. That was almost copy-paste. And when we look at the code flow on the, on the page as well, you can see it as it's nearly identical. There are some differences. For instance, for GangCrab, we developed a vaccine. We built something, we, they made mistakes, and we were able to build a vaccine, roll it out, and nobody got encrypted who had that vaccine. And we made it publicly available, not too public that they could find out, but we had our channels. And those didn't work for Sono Kiwi. They stepped up. They were really robust. As we said, URL generation, I think, Rick, you, uh, you use this to your benefit, benefit as well with your sinkhole stuff. And Another thing that they, uh, is quite similar to the GANCRAB overlap. Uh, I don't know who speaks Russian here in the room, hands? There you go. <laughs> um, a funny one is, these are all the former CIS countries, including Romania and Moldova. The Moldova is always a bit questionable when we look at malware. Very interesting is Syrian. So GANCRAB at the time, they had a, a change of heart and they felt like they need to help the Syrian people because they were under attack. So they released all the decryptors for and all the keys for Syria. And from then on, they blocked any Syrians who had a Syrian keyboard from getting encrypted. Um, in the middle, there's Persian. And we didn't see that before. But at the time, we ran honeypots. And sure enough, we had a honeypot in Israel. Uh, we had them all over the world. And this honeypot in Israel got targeted by, we believe, a Persian-speaking actor. So don't. It's not necessarily nation state. It was a real basic RDP hacking crew because it was, it was actually pretty quite interesting how, interesting how they did it because they infected the machine and, and they had a file they named it 1488, uh, which is an Aryan reference. So if you're uh, familiar with that, 88 Heil Hitler, not to be on camera, but it, it, for us it was, it was very interesting to see. It's like, hey, are they like mocking things or doing things? But anyways, we had RDP honeypot, they broke in, they got a lay of the land, did kind of things, uh, did all kinds of things, and it was really, it was really clumsy. So they, they reached out to their own cloud uh, folder, which was in Persian language, and they downloaded all these tools, and, um, and, and they weren't skilled. So this was literally one of those outsourced criminals, and they were installing coin miners and all that stuff, and then eventually it was boom, Revo got installed. So that was interesting to see. So there, a lot of times you see these languages in malware to prevent from an install in that certain country to avoid prosecution. So we believe that that uh, part Persian was also the case. So I spoke a little bit about the indicators that we saw in, and that we, wait, we collected. So Sony Kibi has it as well. It actually generates a really nice JSON file <coughs> for a sample with, with a lot of, IDs and, and things in there as well, uh, sub IDs, domains. I think, yeah, that you're going to cover that in your piece. Uh, wipe functions, all these things. So, what we're doing right now, we build tooling. So, if we have an infection, we're going to pull out all these IDs because then from a victim, you can link it to the actual perpetrator, even though it's a number. But eventually, when time comes, we can follow the whole chain. So, how do um, these infections take place? Um, the common attack factors that we've seen, um, when you look at email phishing, there's a lot of Cobol strike use actually, but still there is, it's ridiculous how many organizations have weak RDP credentials. It's crazy. It is, you think like, okay, I can't even comment on it, but sure enough, it helps. If you have a honeypot, you get a lot of attacks. So our honeypot as well, and you saw the, the, the common tools, 
And the, the tools on the directory, that, those are literally the tools that the attacker actually dropped on our system. So they, they got in and are like, oh, sweet. OK, let me sit down. And then they just download the tools and then launch mass scan on the network, try to figure out what was going on. And then at a certain moment, we were like, OK, yeah, you're out. Boom, kick. But it gave us a lot of intelligence. So the coin miners had a, con a configuration file, and it contained a, literally an email address. And we could follow that all the way back to an Instagram account. And we could see how he's like having dinner with his girlfriend somewhere in Persia. F funny stuff, but. <laughs> so w where did they get RDP credentials? Well, there's, there's shops. A lot of you might know them. UA shop was set up for fraud. Now is heavily used for actors who are scanning for any corporate networks that you can find. And if they can get a foothold with a local admin account, boom, they're in. Um, this is uh, Azeroth. This is actually a really interesting one. Um, we have really good intelligence that this is currently being used a lot. So criminal actors in the underground are buying up Azeroth logs, pretty basic malware, info stealers, and they want to get credentials because, um, um, and they, they can, can get millions of Azeroth logs and then just search through it for DT search and they're searching for company credentials. Because sure enough, a lot of the MSPs don't change their passwords, unfortunately. So if you, you can have a log from two years ago, and if the password is still valid, you're in. And then you can attack the whole managed service provider and all their customers. And it's literally what we see now. It's big game phishing. There's tons of money going in. And it's fueling this demand in the underground for corporate networks that are compromised. So there's a real supply and demand. And we see that it's getting more and more blatant so there's somebody who's uh, uh, advertising for a metal company in Canada. It's like, hey, I got it up for grabs. You want it? Another one, um, he's been arrested, but um, um, he's offering Pepsi, funny enough. And this was from the marketplace that closed down just before Christmas, uh, Market MS, and that was catered specifically for compromised networks. And there's an actor called AD0 who's known in the underground as a escrow service, so you negotiate with him. And, and even though it's in Russian, he's offering an Asian company with a lot of details. So this gave us the feeling that there's a lot of money going on. So we're like, well, we can analyze all the malware we want. We can look for a code similarity, but can we follow the money? And I'm not really a big financial guy, but we gave it a shot. And every piece in that, um, in that is, is valuable to us. So going back to the initial advertisement that we saw on the 4th of July, when you look in the box, it says that they have a first cut of 60%, and when you get an X amount of installs, there's 70%. So if you have that divider, you might be able to look like, OK, how much money is going in? Because can we look in the blockchain to the 60 and 70% cuts? Because there has to be a divider. And our old friend, Lelorto, came back again and he is funny. I come from, uh, from, from uh, for some of you know, from the cybercrime division from the NSTCU, Team IT Crime. And, um, and you see a lot of criminals and also conventional criminals, but they have a different thing. So conventional criminals, they like to brag with watches and cars and fancy clothes. Well, this individual, he likes to brag with his Bitcoin transaction IDs. So when you look at the screen uh, above, He's posting this on XSS, and he's like, oh, yeah, I made this amount of money. And then a couple of days later, he posted another one with another overview of his transaction IDs. Clearly, he's very proud of his business and that he's making a lot of cash. Well, these transaction IDs are unique. So if you have that amount of strings in your transaction ID, it's pretty easy to find that specific transaction ID, load them all up in a, in, a, in a Bitcoin tracing software, or just walk on the blockchain and map it all out. And sure enough, these are the transaction IDs that he posted on. And this is his yeah, weekend overview. And you could see um, the black dot for the people here. And the, let's see if I can do that in an angle. Right there, that's one of the biggest Bitcoin tumblers in the world, BitMix. And you can see on the top, there's are legitimate exchanges, Coinbase and Gemini. And that's money going in from, from victims. And you see the money going around. So how much did this person make? Well, in the infosec, you don't have to complain. And you can make a pretty decent salary. But this is just crazy. This is 300K in one weekend just by attacking. And sure enough, we went through the blockchain. And that's the beauty of the blockchain. Um, there's some stuff that 
he put aside and he didn't put through the tumbler. And that's about like four and a half million dollars. He has it for a rainy day. That's crazy. And what we also saw was a link to underground markets. And it's, yeah, I realized they're not living in the Netherlands where they, like in Amsterdam, they there's a coffee shop in every corner of the street. But they, uh, they like to use their profits also to buy drugs and uh, get some drugs from Hydra. And Hydra is the largest underground market in Russia. That's the Alpha Bay equivalent of, uh, for the Russians. So it's like, yeah, you can't change it. They're not stacking up on Club Mate, but then probably on, on, on weed. So th that money comes from the victims, as we see. And when you're encrypted, you get this note. You have to go online. And you get your specialized own chat box with Sonon Kibi. And it goes something like this. It's like, hey, hello. And that's the operator. It's like, well, it's uh, $250,000. And uh, after payment, you get one general decryption. So that's their scheme. When they ta target an MSP, each individual victim of an MSP, and I think you, uh, you can show that as well, gets a lower price. Whereas the MSP is like, oh, you can be solved with this problem and just pay us about 250000 and we're not talking about anything, and then you can just go on with your job and help all, all your people. And, um, but you can see the negotiation taking place. So he's like, yeah, I can only pay 120 and then it's like, oh, 175 so that's a big drop. But still, it goes on, and it's, it's a dangerous play, a game to play, though. And then, okay, price reduced to 170 Probably he's short of cash. He spent it all on uh, Hydra, and... Uh, Eventually, sure enough, the actor offers the universal decryptor for that victim, and then they can download it. Um, this specific piece of ransomware is very proud on the fact that the decryptor works really well, and that you can all get your files back when the do job is done. There's other ones, like Ryak. Oh my god, they just bought a shitty piece of malware, or ransomware, and it just deployed on the whole network, and it's, a cr it's, it's, it's unbelievable how that's working even. Even if you have a um, a space in your file name or in your, in your directory path, it just crashes and you, you lose your files forever, literally. Um, but this is not it. It's like, yes, the company is a whole for ransom, that there's negotiations taking place. We all know that, and we can, we can, we can frown upon it, we can think of it, but this is, this is, the, this is happening right now. So this affects our life. And it's getting worse. Um, at the end of last year, we always, that's something the industry does, does threat predictions, and we're like, oh, great. Well, I, was, I wrote a prediction, and it's like, well, I think we're going to get more extortions because all these criminals have complete access to your network while they have complete access to all your files, to all your dirty little secrets, to all your skeletons in the closet, and that the, uh, the main uh, director of the company is having a relationship with Jenny in accounting. That's that, they can see all that stuff. Um, and... Well, I didn't tell it to the actors, but they are taking over, and we can see it with Mays, Sono Kibi, and there's some others, and they are now threatening to publish data, and they're publishing data on going. So uh, I think yesterday night, Sono Kibi published a whole data set belonging to a German car manufacturer, and that's, uh, that's a sorry site. That's not, not, not a good site. Um, so is all hope lost? Well, not completely. I think Tesorian spoke about this as well. We, we do have no more ransom. That being said, you do have to have keys for Sonon Kibi in order to load it up. But it worked with GANCRAB, and there's similarity. So if we keep on fighting, we might be able to fig figure it out as well. And it's not a lost fight, because there's a lot of money already saved. But um, I will hand it over, like completely fluently, to Rick. Yeah. <laughs> and he can take over to his research. We thought long and hard on this transition, uh, and then... <coughs> like a DJ, like... <coughs> yeah, so there's no skill involved. Boom. Transition. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Far you, too kind. already got kudos to start. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, um, yeah, as uh, John mentioned in the beginning, um, I wanted to do a uh, talk about, uh, uh, about Revol. John wanted to talk about Revol. And we both had very different perspectives. I th in fact, we actually got into this totally differently. So John had like a whole structured approach with like uh, uh, people getting infected and research stuff. Uh, I just spoke to uh, Ronnie uh, on Twitter <laughs> and um, he showed, uh, he's from uh, uh, Sophos, uh, uh, and he showed an interesting infection vector. He was like, oh, look at this, it's, <laughs> it's fun. So I looked at it 
And I was like, oh, it's uh, like a standard download and execute PowerShell Cradle, which is cool uh, because we also use this a lot in like phishing attempts and stuff like that. And I noticed that the malware was being downloaded from Pastebin. And at the time I was working on a Pastebin scraper and it had to have like a proper excuse to build it and use it. And well, this was my excuse. So what I decided to do <coughs> was start uh, at least scraping these, uh, these uh, Pastebin files. And if you look at the file itself, it's actually uh, invoke reflective PE injection by Joe Bialek. It's part of, uh, of a bigger toolkit with all kinds of PowerShell fun stuff. And they modify, uh, they modify it slightly to do, uh, like they load the DLL into memory and then I execute it. Um, yeah, and they use the Cradle to do so. Uh, so I started looking into this uh, funny side note. Initially, I was looking at the invoke and then the randomness at the end, which worked great. Uh, and then one day I was like, wow, there's a huge spike in new Revel samples. What's going on? Um, and then I started noticing that they all had the same name. Turns out uh, the Buran ransomware guys were like, oh, this seems like a great idea. Let's steal it. And they just copied one of the, the, the Revel infection uh, files and put their own malware into the, uh, to the, to the, to the script. So um, what we decided to do was extract all the DLLs from all these scripts and then extract the configuration from those. So uh, as John mentioned before, there are many different uh, configuration options, but for uh, the intensive purposes of this part of the talk, we'll focus on uh, domain. So these are is a, this is a list of a thousand plus uh, domains that are used for C2 traffic, and I'll explain the quotes later. Uh, the net value, it's a Boolean that describes if there's even C2 traffic uh, going on. The PID, so which affiliate is, is doing the uh, operation, and the campaign ID. And I want to focus a bit more on the campaign ID because what we noticed across different uh, samples is that even though the PIDs changed per, per affiliate, the subs were actually uh, incre incremental across all samples. So this gave us the ability to actually count the number of campaigns that they prepare on the back end. That doesn't tell you anything about uh, if these campaigns were either successful, if they received payment, if they even infected someone, or if it's just playing around. But it does give you an indicator of how active they are. Um, currently, these are some old uh, 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 screenshots. Oh no, I updated them. These are new screenshots. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, they're currently in the 3000s. Um, uh, one campaign is usually related to one specific thing they're doing. It uh, doesn't mean one specific so they can have multiple samples for the same campaign. Uh, it has to do with uh, different like uh, MSP and then victim or, or client of the MSP, stuff like that. So, well, we were looking at, we saw like different campaigns and we saw like different samples. But what we really want to know is like how much money are these guys making? And uh, the more I looked into this, the more we figured out that uh, <laughs> we y you actually have a hard time tracking this. Because every uh, <coughs> victim gets, uh, gets a ransom note on his PC, and if you visit the website, you get a nice website, you submit your data, and then you get the ransom. And then they have unique Bitcoin addresses uh, per uh, URL. So even if you're in, you work in the same company and your sysadmin is already chatting with them, maybe even paying, you won't see the same Bitcoin address or the same chat data as your sysadmin is seeing even though you visit, this, you, you submit the same data. So they, they really try to split that, which is quite annoying because that means that we won't be able to do like the nice uh, Bitcoin analysis that, uh, that you guys did based on the leaked data. However, what, what we can do with this information is that we can at least track how much are they asking, uh, which is already interesting. It doesn't show if they pay. I mean, we don't know, but at least we know how much they're asking. So we have to build this. So we built uh, a, a set of bash scripts because that's how you automate anything. Uh, and what we do is we scrape all the samples from Pastebin and we submit these samples to uh, Triage, which is a Dutch uh, sandbox uh, company. And uh, it's really cool. Uh, Julian, the owner, uh, actually f changed his sandbox for us because what the malware does at runtime is it, it gets the volume ID and the CPU ID and makes CRC32 hash and that creates your unique URL. So we had a problem because every time we ran the sample, 
we got the same unique URL. So we couldn't use it. We actually, I noticed this after I put in 200 samples. So we ran 200 samples and then I got back the same URL each and every time. Uh, so he, in his spare time, fixed that for us and now gets random volume IDs. Uh, so we retrieve the ransom node, we submit that data to the backend. Here you can see decryptor on top. That website or the, the, the clear text domain is uh, unfortunately uh, was taken offline. There was a dude and he thought that it uh, shouldn't be online which I can get, but at the same time, there's people that have to have pay, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, we parse that, uh, the data, to get the actual amounts. So these are some of the uh, demands. So here on the left, you can see the group. Then you can see the target. They can say either, oh, your computer has been infected, or they say your network has been infected. <coughs> and that's like configurable on the, on the attacker side. And as you can see, there's also a discrepancy. Like if you see com network, you see 100K, like 500K, stuff like that. And if you look at computer, it's more like 4K, 6K, 10K, more reasonable uh, ransom demands. Um, the lowest number we saw was $777, which seems like a test or a joke. Uh, and the highest number we saw was 15 million. Uh, so there, there's a huge range. So back to the C2 traffic. Um, it's not actually C2 traffic, it's just used for statistics. So they have a list of domains, legit domains, and uh, they just fire and forget uh, the data. So it's being pushed to legit websites, actually. Um, and I'm still unsure if they hacked some of the websites, if they hid their actual C2 domain inside the list of a thousand, mm. or if all the websites were hacked. Uh, but the last would be yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, very... Uh, yeah, it would be like a, a thousand plus different websites to hack. Seems like a lot of work. So we're still unsure on that. Um, and last week they changed the C2 list, so at least for a specific set of, uh, of samples. Um, fortunately, we also sync hold some of those, so we, we remain, uh, we can keep visibility on that. So to give you a, an idea of all the uh, different domains, these are some of the Dutch uh, domains. I personally really like broccolisoup.nl, <laughs> uh, which is just fun, uh, and Bert Butter. I don't know the dude, but he seems like a fun guy. Um, so why so many domains? And uh, we, we, were we were uncertain about this. So we were thinking, well, if they have so many domains, maybe some of those domains are yeah, still available, or maybe somebody didn't renew his domain. So we decided to, to look. And that gave us uh, the ability to actually get uh, infection traffic. And here is also, uh, if you pay attention to the, uh, to the URL, you can see the same structure also blocked about uh, by the Tesorion uh, guys and girls. Um, it always has this structure. So we use that for advantage to filter out random traffic on our sinkholes to not get like uh, you know, shitty data. Um, well, I was pretty happy about this. I was pretty stoked. I was like, oh, I can see who got hacked, which domain, like which name. It's going to be so much fun, uh, at least seeing it. That means shitty for the companies, but still fun to look at. And then I figured that all posted data is actually encrypted. So what we received is just a blob of yeah, encrypted data. And most companies use NOT. Uh, so we just saw like a lot of hits with random data from one IP. So did one PC get encrypted, did a million? What, what's happening here? Um, so we decided to, to test this. What we did is we got multiple VMs and infected them multiple times with the ransomware. And then looked on our backend to see, uh, okay, how is the data coming in? And what we figured out that uh, if you hash the blob you get, that one runtime of one Revel sample creates a unique blob. So even though I'm getting it in on multiple sinkholes, the data remains the same. And since Revol is like ransomware, so it's run once and then not again, which if you run it twice, it's going to get well shitty well. and the data is... <laughs> no, they not a good thing. actually prevent it. Yeah, yeah they yeah. do a mutex. Nice. Um, so that allows us to actually see like, okay, one hash is actually one unique infection, uh, which gives us the ability to map this. So uh, here's a world map. And you can see like all the different countries that uh, got hit in, in the five, six months we we're, uh, uh, we're receiving the information. And uh, well, John already mentioned the no working in uh, sys rule. 
And, uh, well, I think they're actually getting, uh, people are actually listening, which is nice. And Greenland, but I don't know why. Greenland? Uh, look. Oh, yeah. That <laughs> uh, would be shitty. Like, you're there, the <laughs> only thing you have is your laptop with some movies, and then it gets encrypted. <laughs> I would be pissed. Um, funny side note, there are some infections actually coming from Russia, uh, which we still need to look into. Uh, is it, uh, like, some dude from a uh, Western company that's there on a business trip, connects to the VPN, gets encrypted? Or is it maybe uh, testing traffic? Because the moment you put debug on true in this ransomware, it doesn't look at the uh, keyboard language anymore. So even though you have a Russian keyboard layout, it will just infect the system. So is this testing? Is this like somebody on a business trip? We don't know. Well, um, we decided to look a bit more at the impact on the Netherlands. And if you look at that, it's actually, well, it depends on your viewing, but it's not that bad. Um, like inside of the, these numbers, there's also some uh, 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 surfnet uh, uh, testing traffic. So we can see that there are some sandboxes in the Netherlands. So it's not, uh, it's not actually uh, all uh, encrypted companies. We are seeing some companies that uh, uh, unfortunately are hit, and then you see like 20, 30 systems being hacked. But it's yeah, not huge, not on a scale that we've seen in the US, for example, or in uh, Asia. Uh, and actually, uh, currently we're lucky. And Netherlands, if you look at the top uh, uh, 10, they're not even in it. But <coughs> those things can change pretty quickly. We saw uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, two attacks, one in Europe, one in uh, Africa, where um, yeah, there were just two MSPs being hacked. Uh, uh, the, w <laughs> the one in Europe was pretty shitty. We, uh, we were looking at the sinkhole data, and we were actually seeing like uh, vineyards, so uh, like uh, where they made wine, like very small vineyards being encrypted but they just all have the same like IT service provider, unfortunately. Um, and these uh, two attacks cr made sure that uh, both uh, the African country and the European country are now in the top 10. So it's, it only takes like one nice hit on, a, on MSP and you're gone. Um, looking at the actual traffic, you can see like somewhere around 500 unique infections per day, which is not, I mean, yeah, it's not that bad. Um, but looking at the spikes makes it a bit more interesting. So uh, we tried to uh, map like the, the spike data to like a certain company or maybe even the MSP behind that company uh, to see what happened. Um, side note, the data here, we filtered out Asia. Um, it's not because we're racist. It's just I had a lot of difficulty mapping those IPs to a company, like either the SSL data or based on who is data, it was just very hard. Uh, so yeah, for all intents and purposes, it's very Western oriented uh, in this case. So uh, the big spike is like a huge uh, MSP in the, in the US and you actually never, uh, it was never mentioned in the news. Childcare centers being, uh, being hacked. Uh, something, something Thailand in Indonesia. Uh, yeah, don't know. Something happened, and the data there is uh, it's pretty poor uh, to, to figure out. Um, the dentistry offices, which was funny because I was looking at the data, and I, s I mentioned to, uh, to Wesley, like, hey, dude, I'm seeing lots and lots of infection traffic, uh, something, something dentist, no clue. And uh, he was like, oh, yeah, I don't know, don't know. Um, yeah, can you figure anything out? We couldn't. We just saw individual companies, and there was no real relationship between them. And like uh, two weeks later, Krebs on Security publishes an article about the actual MSP that got hacked, and yeah, we just saw the after effects of, uh, of that such a thing. The US-based, uh, oh, yeah, the US-based MSSP, which stands for Managed Services, uh, so Managed Security Service Provider, <coughs> which makes it more painful. Um, yeah, something, something Canada, another MSP, and the beautician's office, which was even more fun uh, to us, um, because it just looked, uh, uh, looked interesting. Uh, and also, uh, the, f the company, unfortunately, was not as open as uh, the university uh, we had in the Netherlands. So it wasn't very clear to uh, employees of the company or clients of the company what was happening. And that reflected heavily on social media, mm -hmm. where lots of people were worried uh, or, or even annoyed because they couldn't do their job, they weren't making money. Um, so that created uh, friction. Uh, which is unfortunate, so it shows that it's very important to be and clear. And it was funny how we got started as well. We were on both on the phone, and we had some data <laughs> on the beautician as well. I was like, hey, Rick, uh, wh what do you got on the 13th of December? 
And he's like, oh, a beautician. I was like, oh, bingo, I have similar data. Yeah. <laughs> we could match it. Was it like 6.40 in the evening? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. You can actually see it ramping up, and then you see, uh, it was really interesting because the data on, on the other side matched our data really well, um, which is really cool. So we decided to, uh, to create some overall uh, statistics about the whole thing. Uh, and what we've seen of Revel up until now is that they have prepared at least over 3,000 different campaigns. Uh, this doesn't mean that they actually executed all of them, but yeah. Um, we've seen over 150,000 unique infections in the past six months, which if you look at like a huge botnet, it's not even that much. But since they are target, <coughs> since they are so targeted and they are actually encrypting entire companies, uh, the, the impact is devastating. Um, we've seen them demand more than uh, 45 million uh, dollars. And if you look at an average infection, you can see that uh, the normal average is around 250K. Uh, but if you look at the network-based attacks, you get an average of 450K. Um, so yeah, the, the amounts go up quickly. Uh, and we're actually only seeing part of the total picture. So the sinkhole data, if the uh, net boolean is uh, disabled for like, uh, for example, TravelX, they disabled all the statistics information. So we didn't even see the travel X attack, but that was like a huge one. Um, and uh, at the same time, we're only uh, tracking the pay spin Revel samples. So there's way more uh, Revel samples being distributed in different methods. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is what we see. We see 45 million. But if you extrapolate this and you see 3,000 campaigns, 250,000 on average per campaign, imagine how much money these guys are asking for. Uh, and yeah, if you match that on 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 the large to getting at least 300k in a weekend. Yeah, and and the whole system we believe is um, the amount of affiliates. When we did the gang grab research, we uh, added up with a, uh, approximately 150 affiliates, whereas Revo is more tailor made and more bespoke, and that's about between 40, maybe 50 people at the same time can operate it. So that's not a bad paycheck with just 40 people. It's going well. And this big business. And you can you can also see on the forums, they're asking, saying like, no, no affiliates, we're full. And then a week later, oh, oh, we have three spots. And then, oh, no, we're full again. So it's a, it's a people want in on this service. They really want to join. So. And, and uh, that makes sense, because it's a business model. Eh? So if you have a good salesperson and who performs, you have to have your sales targets. And if you don't perform, you get, you won't get kicked out. You can't. Mm -hmm. So that's their way of, keeping up with uh, the best of the best. Yep. And, the, and right now there's like almost like a s safe situation in the underground where a lot of these affiliates learn from their own mistakes and get more and more, well, better and better at what they do, and more skilled. Uh, the M whole MSP story started with Gang Crab. There was only one affiliate who did that and he moved to Sonom Kibi and now like two thirds of them are doing the same trick. Because there's money to be made. They're, they're, they're talking about the secrets and about the tricks. I mean, even if, like, let's say you get, you wake up in the morning, you go to your office, and your systems are encrypted, and then you notice that uh, that's due to the fact that one of your suppliers messed up. I mean, the, the pressure on that supplier to actually fix that solution or fix that situation very quickly is immense. So it's a very, it also a lot of leverage to, to make uh, somebody pay. And I think, this also connects really nicely to something we want to ask you guys. There's been a lot of discussion uh, in, uh, in the news. Uh, there's different people with different opinions on this. But the question is, to pay or not to pay? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, th there are a lot of companies that decide to pay. I mean, otherwise, this whole ransomware s business model wouldn't work. At the same time, if you don't have any options, and otherwise your company would go bankrupt, wouldn't it be smarter to pay? And that's uh, something we would like to ask you guys. So what do you guys think? Should you pay or should you refrain? So hands up, who would say pay? Hands up, who says no pay? Oh, that's like 50, 50. Yeah, it's like nice 50, 50. Now fight. <laughs> 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 no, it's actually, does anybody have anything? Uh, because that's also, this was our presentation. Are there any questions? And is there anybody willing to comment on why pay or why not pay? Here's a question. Do you know any other attack factors besides paste bin? Uh, direct RDP and email. So they leave it open to the affiliate. 
Um, and, then, and then the Azeroth, that's just using valid accounts. So they, they try to find or they buy up giant amount of log files. They use account checkers and then uh, they hack into it. What we've seen by looking at a lot of the affiliates and what we do is like a anyone who vouches for the system, we look at, okay, who's, what, what is his interest or her interest? Who are they talking to? And what we saw, there's a lot of overlap with a certain type of RDP brute forcing tool, which is very popular. So that's still also heavily used. I was actually wondering, because you're actually looking at uh, many different affiliates, uh, I believe there were like hundreds, I was actually quite curious, uh, how many of, uh, of, of these affiliates, how big percentage would you estimate are actually an advanced uh, attacker? Um, well, for some Kibi, we think about 40 to 50. Um, we have a hypothesis of how it, how it actually grew, and that's that... Um, that's our hypothesis right now, that somehow from GANCRAB, the best affiliates were handpicked, and they moved over. Yeah. And um, even though there's a partner scheme, don't underestimate the power of these affiliates. Uh, we've I've worked in the past on getting people behind CTB Locker, and these were Romanian individuals who had a large botnet, and they were very capable of spreading stuff by their own, but just a f partnering up with a ransomware was, uh, was easy money. It was just... Uh, they just have to point their botnet in the right way, get all these infections, and then they would just sit back and relax and just chat a little bit with the victims and get the money. So there's, there's definitely, with Sony Kiwi specifically, there's a very high um, tolerance, so they don't let anyone in. There's a briefing interview. Uh, we tried. We didn't succeed. I can say that. Uh, not that we're not technical, but, but our Russian was not good enough. <laughs> there you go. So, and then it stops. But um, yes, make no mistake, these guys are good. They're very solid. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a general question on ransomware uh, on what you see. Do you also see payments uh, uh, in other cryptocurrencies besides Bitcoin? Yes, there is. When we look at the payments, the other currency of choice is dash but that's almost non-significant compared yeah. to bitcoin because you also have how do you that's the whole thing it's like the victim you target is not the cryptocurrency expert it is a, a person or a, or an organization and they need to acquire uh bitcoins as well and for them it's like the bitcoin it by itself is the easiest, easiest yeah. to acquire If there are no more questions, I would really like to express my gratitude to both KPN Security and McAfee. And I uh, also would like to point out that I like the, the cross-referencing to, to Sorion and also to Sophos. So in true hacker hotel spirit, you see that on this conference, everybody helps each other, is in contact with each other. So that, for me, is a great, um, yeah, I think, achievement. So thank you so much, and please give it up for Rick van Duin, KPN Security, and John Fokker and McAfee, please. Thank you.